been told what to watch out for. Fever, a loss of taste or smell, a dry cough, just some of the symptoms. <coughs> but the effects of COVID-19 on the body can go well beyond those and run much deeper. A disease that begins in the lungs can have a profound impact on many parts of the body. For some, the effects can be long lasting. And there are many people showing symptoms of what we call long COVID, where people are having health consequences long after they are uh, supposed to have recovered from the infection. Most COVID patients recover within weeks, but some have been living with the effects for months. Exactly how long it can last, we have yet to find out. Could COVID-19 be a disease from which some of us never fully recover? And this is DW's COVID-19 special. Hello and welcome to the show. I'm Stephen Beardsley in Berlin. Two to six weeks, that's the typical recovery time for a COVID-19 patient, at least according to the World Health Organization. But not for all. Researchers are trying to figure out why some patients experience the disease more seriously and suffer more long-term consequences. Here's the story of one such case. Eric Altman is struggling to return to normal life. The 51-year-old was infected with COVID-19 in March. It started with a cold and a bad cough, and then a trip to the emergency room. He was in an artificial coma for two and a half months. Now he's being treated at a neurological rehab clinic in the southern German town of Erlangen. He has to relearn everything, walking, talking, even how to sit up. I had no pre-existing conditions, nothing. It came straight out of the blue. I hadn't been abroad, I hadn't been on a ski trip. My friends were fine. I just don't know how I got it. Altman is a sports reporter for a newspaper. Helping him get through all this is his positive attitude and the support from his family, his wife, and his four children. It was touch and go. There were times when I almost didn't make it. The neurologist treating Altman, Dr. Friedrich from Rosen, diagnosed a cerebellar dysfunction which can be directly attributed to Altman's COVID-19 virus. He also has scar tissue on his lungs and no one knows if he'll ever recover from that. We see patients who've developed weak hearts, which they never previously suffered from. We see patients with liver impairment, which only slowly returns to normal function. We see patients with distinct muscle paralysis due to nerve damage, which only gradually heals. We also see others whose muscle paralysis quickly subsides. So we see quite a wide variety of symptoms affecting different organs. Research on the illness is going on everywhere including at the Klinikum in Nuremberg. In the meantime, it's become clear that the virus does attack the brain. It can even cause strokes and make a person's immune system overreact. It's an illness that in many respects is unique. We learn new things every week and every month about it, and we'll only be able to look back in a few years in order to say what we've done right and what we've done wrong. 10% of patients have a hard time with this disease, just like Eric Altman has. 90% do recover, even if it does take some time. Eric Altman's wife told us recently that her husband continues to make progress since that story was filmed and can now feed himself again. Speaking and walking remain difficult, however. The good news is that he has been relocated to a clinic much closer to the family's home. All right, let's talk more about recovery times with Jan Hennigs. He's a specialist for pulmonary medicine and co-lead of the post-COVID-19 clinic at the University of Hamburg Medical Center. Jan, thank you for joining us. Jan, is there such a thing as post-COVID syndrome? Well, apparently there is, right? So we have reports of um, probably thousands of patients uh, reporting long-term effects after the disease. Um, ranging from um, fatigue, um, mental problems, but also um, breathlessness. So yes, uh, we have to say there seems to be something like that. 
Are we talking about the damage from a serious case of COVID, for example, like lung damage or heart damage? Or are we talking about an ongoing pathology? For example, some people saying that their smell and taste go again months later. That's the, um, that's the basic paradigm. So that the virus is causing cellular damage and these, this damage then uh, translate into long-term effects and long-term problems. Um, but there seems to be an additional component to that that is not just explained by the direct um, cellular damage that we have to figure out. Um, and we, we know from uh, many viral diseases that there are long-term um, effects, the, the reconvalescence can be long, um, there, there might be neural um, um, problems. So what we really have to figure out now is what's specific to the virus, what's additional, but nevertheless, I mean, we, we have probably thousands, I mean, given the, um, the 40 million infected people, we probably have hundreds of thousands of people with um, uh, patient with long COVID. So that's gonna be a, a real burden to our healthcare system. So we really have to figure out a way to see these patients in the clinic and to help them. What are the common symptoms or conditions that we're seeing that might be lumped under long COVID? Well, um, basically we're seeing a whole variety of, of uh, symptoms. So you might even call it a syndrome because basically the, the most commonly reported uh, symptom seems to be fatigue but um, shortness of breath, headache, joint pain, um, 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 red eyes, so muscle pain. So there's a, a lot of things, but also we have anxiety. We have a cognitive impairment. Um, so that is really a whole variety of plethora of, of symptoms that we're dealing with. And that makes it so difficult to basically um, treat the patients well, because it is, I mean, we need a lot of specialists to really take care of the patients. You're at the beginning of this study, a two-year study. Um, I have to ask you, even though you're at the beginning, do you have any sort of results or any sort of um, trends that you're seeing right now that are applicable to how we look at long COVID? Obviously, since we just started a couple of weeks ago, we don't have any solid data, and that is basically the main problem we're dealing with um, all around the world in, in, um, in uh, long COVID. Um, so what we're seeing is, which is interesting, so the, the disease in our cohort is not associated um, naturally with the um, severity of the acute infection. So we have patients who are totally fine even after, as you showed in your, in your um, movie, um, in, had a severe disease with um, acute lung damage and still they recovered completely. So now the, um, the lung function totally normal. The patients are feeling better than ever. But on the other hand, we have, we have seen p um, patients with mild disease who are doing terrible right now. They can't recover and they're really they're unable to work. So that is a big problem. Um, and we don't know how that um, um, belongs together. But others have shown that basically women seem to be at higher risk to have more severe long COVID. Um, if you're older, you seem to be uh, at risk to have um, long COVID, but really we have to find out what's going on there. And that's why we're trying to, to um, investigate for two years um, how the symptoms evolve and how, um, um, how we can help patients best. At the beginning of this pandemic, COVID-19 was really described as a respiratory illness. Based on what we know now, how would you describe it? Well, it certainly starts uh, in the lungs. And we know that it affects the, the blood vessels and the kidney is uh, a main target of the acute uh, disease. But from the uh, long-term symptoms, the long-term effects, it seems to be a syndrome. So it seems to really affect every part of the body so far, the muscular system, the cognitive system, um, even um, the psyche is part of it. So um, it is it is something that we really have to do. We really have to look into how this um uh, how we can help these patients and really mm. how we actually are able to see all these patients because this might be, they, um, these patients might be in the hundreds of thousands. All right, Jan Hennigs at University of Hamburg Medical Center. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks for having me. And now it's time for your questions. It's the part of the show where our science correspondent, Derek Williams, answers the questions you've posted to our YouTube channel. Over to Derek. If you're diagnosed with COVID-19 and are recovering at home, what measures should you take to prevent your family from catching it as well? 
The last thing you want to do if you catch COVID-19 is give it to your friends or, or family. Unfortunately, um, that can prove challenging if you live in the same household. Um, on the positive side, the evidence we have so far indicates that after your symptoms appear, um, with every day that passes, you'll likely grow less infectious. Uh, though it's still grinding its way through studies, at least currently, we think that maximum infectiousness hits around the first day that you show symptoms, if not before. So if you tested positive after you developed symptoms and are now convalescing at home and the people around you have tested negative, then the likelihood you'll infect them should, as a rule, drop by the day. Um, here's what authorities recommend you do. First, uh, no visitors, of course, and both you and caregivers should wear masks in any interactions. Even if it's hard, um, stay as isolated as you possibly can, preferably in your own room with a window that can remain open if temperatures permit it, um, door closed. Try to only eat there as well. A dedicated set of silverware and plates is a good idea. Um, if you have the option in your home of, of multiple bathrooms and toilets, then dedicate one to your use. Uh, limit contact with caregivers. If at all possible, uh, they really shouldn't belong to a high-risk group. Um, they'll need to disinfect regularly. Uh, leave any dirty laundry or bed linens unwashed for as long as possible. And finally, uh, don't forget that caregivers will also need to quarantine for as long as health authorities require, even if that means long after your own symptoms have improved. Science correspondent Derek Williams there. Don't forget that you can post your questions to Derek on our YouTube channel. And if you'd like to keep up with the latest developments on the coronavirus, do subscribe to our newsletter. Just log on to dw.com slash corona dash newsletter. That's all for us. Thanks for watching. <laughs>